Hello and welcome to the first video in Unit 0. This one is going to be all about Chapter 1. And the first thing that I would like you to do for this chapter is go into the book, either your online book or the physical copy if you want to borrow one, and go to page 4. So this is the very beginning of Chapter 1. And the case study is going to help to define the terms sustainability and tragedy of the commons. And these are going to be two things that we talked about extensively this year. So please make sure that you have a good understanding of what both of them mean. And I'll give you a little bit of a clue. They both are referring to goods and services that the environment or the earth provides for us. And sustainability is going to be, going to be important for us as we move into the future. And tragedy of the commons is going to be something that we will want to avoid. Okay. And for this, we're talking about not just things that we're taking from the environment, but what we're also putting into the environment, things like maybe pollution. Okay. Um, so for these slides that have red text, what I would suggest is obviously going into the book and reading and finding the information that is needed and writing it down. Okay. So at the end, once you understand what tragedy of the commons uh, means, and you see some of the examples given in this case study, try to come up with three more and write those down as well. So environmental science, let's go ahead and define that right now. So we are talking about all of the parts of the earth. So the geosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, the biosphere, all of these non-living and living things working together to help to support life. And that's really what environmental science is all about, um, life, okay? Um, so we're gonna talk about all of these components of the earth. And then we're also going to talk about how humans interact with those components of the earth. And really we, what we wanna think about is how we can improve how we interact with the earth and live more sustainable, uh, sorry, sustainably. Um, so the red question here that I'd like you to figure out on your own is what uh, is environmentalism and how does it compare to environmental science? All right, so now let's talk a little bit more about sustainability. And uh, there are three basic principles here that are important um, to understand. So uh, the dependence on solar energy, like more than 99% of life on earth is dependent on solar energy. And um, their life would be either very different or not exist at all if we didn't have all, all that energy coming from the sun. Okay, so we need that for um, the nutrients and energy that we uh, get from plants, okay, as humans, but also for warmth. Biodiversity is really important. So having lots of species of animals and even a lot of variety within a species helps to make uh, an ecosystem more sustainable. And then nutrient, uh, sorry, nutrient cycling or chemical cycling is our third point here. And that is one of the most important things here because organisms get their nutrients, their chemicals from the environment, but once an organism dies or when it gets eaten by another organism, there's a transfer of those nutrients from one thing to the other. Okay, so it's not just stock in one organism forever. All right, here's a little nice graphic of those three things. All right, now what is natural capital? So these are like natural resources, basically. So things that the environment provides for us, they could be things as simple as air, where we get oxygen from as animals, uh, energy like from the sun or wind that we can use for things like generating electricity, um, soil that we need to grow crops and so on. Okay. So this is detailing natural resources in blue things that we get, um, but also ecosystem services, which are going to be processes, um, that are important for life that an ecosystem will do on its own for free. Okay, so now I want you to think, you, you probably know at least two of these already, but what are the three categories of natural resources? Um, see if you can figure that out on your own um, or go into the book to determine it. And then I also want you to think of a few examples of each. Okay, and then finally, um, 
figure out what an ecosystem service is. So all three of these things are in the book. I did just kind of talk about ecosystem services. Um, so you might already have an idea, but go ahead and pause and maybe go figure that out on your own in the book. All right, and if you waited patiently, um, this slide looks at the three different categories of natural resources. So you have probably heard of renewable and non-renewable. Renewable are things that can grow back or come back or basically refresh itself so that we can have a continuous supply of it as long as we don't use too much at once though, okay? Because if we use too much, you know, for example, if we clear cut a forest, then we might not have those trees for a long time after that. Non-renewable, you use it, it's gone. Uh, these things take a very long time to produce, like for oil, natural gas, or coal, these fossil fuels. They take hundreds of thousands or millions of years to develop. Inexhaustible, these are things that we will never uh, run out of, right? Solar energy coming from the sun, wind energy, which is linked to the sun as well, as well as geothermal energy, which is coming from the core of the earth, okay? Things that will never go away, things that we should have a good supply of for uh, a very long time, if not forever, as long as we take care of them, and things that when we use them, they're gone. Okay, three more things here for sustainability. So full cost pricing or economics. Um, so if we want to be sustainable, we have to understand what uh, not just the value of something, but also some of the harmful effects that it may have on the environment and um, charging more as a result of that. Okay, so making it less beneficial to use something that is harmful to the environment. Uh, politics or win-win solutions, trying to come up with solutions that are good for both economic side and for the environmental side. And then finally, for ethics or responsibility to the future generations, thinking about our kids or our kids' kids, um, generations from now, what their earth is going to look like and wanting them to have the same quality of life that we have right now. So taking care of the environment to ensure that. Okay, nice little graphic here for the same thing. <clears throat> Economic, uh, I'm sorry, ecological footprints. Um, so ecological footprints and carbon footprint footprints are two different things. Ecological footprint is thinking about any product that you use, um, the land and water that goes into providing that for you, right? So food is very simple to think about, um, but any product that you buy really, you know, maybe your bag or the shirt that you're wearing, all of these took a certain amount of land and water to produce, okay? So um, in this presentation, you can click on the ecological footprint to go and check that out and fill out a quick survey, It'll take you like five, 10 minutes and um, um, see what your ecological footprint looks like. And it'll give you more information. Carbon footprint is similar, but instead of being concerned about the land and water, it's actually concerned about your carbon emissions as a result of either the things that you release directly, like through a car, right? By burning gasoline, um, or perhaps the electricity that you use or the products that you buy, all right? So go ahead and check out the carbon footprint as well. All right, so our footprints are determined by really three things. And for this, we're talking about uh, like a country's footprint. So the population is gonna be important. The more people you have, the more impact um, that country is going to have. Affluence is important as well. So how much resources a population uses. If a population has more affluence, they're going to use more stuff. Okay. Um, but it's also important to realize that poverty can have negative impacts as well. Even though they're not using as much, conditions are um, sometimes worse and can have uh, worse effects on the environment as well. Right. And technology is kind of interesting because it can go either way. Some things can have a positive impact on the environment. Some can have a negative impact. So it really depends. So this is called the IPAT model. So the uh, uh, impact of our footprint is equal to the population times the affluence times the technology. All right, so this is a look at the human population um, throughout history. So it has grown very, very slowly. And then within the past few hundred years, 
has really started to grow exponentially as a result of a couple of different things. So the agricultural revolution helped um, with providing food for a larger population. The industrial revolution did a lot of the same, but also providing us with uh, not just the ability to produce more food, but also better health care. Okay, so as a result, the population has really boomed. We are very close to 8 billion at this point, and the population could go a few different ways. Uh, it could level off. This is, you know, a low uh, estimate. This is a medium estimate. This is a pretty high estimate that by 20, uh, or sorry, 2100, we would have a population that is more than double what we have now. Okay, so the question is, uh, what's going to happen to the human population? What are some of the impacts that the earth will have on us in determining whether our population starts to level off at one of these points or if it continues growing up? All right, and then finally, we are going to look at the rule of 70 here. This is a very simple um, equation here. There are two variables, the doubling time in years, the growth rate as a percentage, and the doubling time is equal to 70 over the growth rate, which you just plug in as the number. Don't worry about converting it from the percent, okay? So this is going to help us to determine that if we have a population with a steady growth rate, how long will it take for it to double? So let's do a couple of examples, All right? So going with our equation here, what is the growth rate of a population that doubles over a span of 30 years? So what do we know? Well, the doubling time is equal to 30 years. What do we want to know? We want to know this growth rate. So we know the one variable. We got to figure out the other one. So let's plug in what we know. We need this. So we need to get this on its own. So we're going to multiply both sides by the growth rate, get it over here. 30 years times the growth rate is equal to 70. It's still not on its own. We need to get it on its own. So we're going to do that by dividing by 30 years on both sides. All right, so the growth rate is equal to third, uh, sorry, 70 over 30 years. That gives us 2.3%. Okay, so that number that we get from here is the percent. Don't worry about multiplying it by 100 um, and, and so on. Okay, so that's the first sample problem. The next one, um, oops, I'm sorry. I, I wrote the question wrong. I didn't change it. Um, but we know that the growth rate is 5%. And we're going to plug that in here. So we just put that five in there. Don't worry about the percent. The doubling time in years is going to be equal to 70 over five. And when we do that math, it comes out to 14 years. So that means that with a 5% growth rate, it's going to take 14 years for the uh, population to double, which is pretty fast. All right. So last thing that we've got here, the environmental worldviews. So we have planetary management, stewardship, environmental wisdom. Planetary management is a little bit more on the side of uh, controlling the environment, using it for our own ends and not and, and kind of being of the mindset that the environment will continue to provide us with everything that we need, it will not run out, technology will help us. Stewardship is a little bit more geared towards uh, making sure that the earth is sustainable, um, still has a little bit more uh, planetary management, um, but there is a little bit more concern about um, the earth, understanding that we are dependent on it and working towards uh, making sure that it is sustainable. Environmental wisdom is on the other end here. And this is the understanding that we are completely dependent on nature, that we need it for um, sustaining our lives, that resources are limited, we don't have an infinite supply of anything, and we need to take care of what we have, all right? So at this point, you know, you might have any one of these three worldviews right now, maybe you're over more towards this end, and that's okay. Perhaps by the end of this class, we'll move you a little bit more towards stewardship or environmental wisdom. All right, last part of this chapter, uh, economics and policy. I'm going to ask that you look at these on your own. This will not be on the unit zero test, but I, I would like you to maybe check it out. 1.4 is economics. 1.5 is uh, environmental law. And on this slide, it details the ones that we are going to be discussing throughout this year that you need to know for the AP test. 
Um, so it wouldn't hurt to check them out now. But again, like I said, they will not be on this quiz, um, but we will talk about them later in the year. All right, so that's all for unit zero, chapter one. Go and check out chapter two once you are done with this. All right, thank you for tuning in.